Hi, everyone. Long time no see. This is Mookie Alexander from SB Nation's Field Goals. I am the managing editor. And today we're doing a long, long, long overdue mailbag. It's better late than never, I suppose, because we are two weeks out from the NFL draft in Detroit, and we have a lot to get to. In fact, this is the first video I've done since just before the Steelers game last season. And obviously the Steelers game took such a toll on me that I pulled out just about all of my hair. Now, as always, these mailbag questions originate from the fieldgoals.com comments section. So heartfelt thanks to everyone who submitted their questions, even the ones I didn't get to in this clip. So without further ado, let's get to the first question that comes from Lou City Hawk. In fact, we're going to have a couple of questions from Lou City Hawk. But the first one is, uh, with Troy Faltanu being the near consensus pick for the Seahawks and given Faltanu's relative skill and potential future at left tackle, would you foresee the Seahawks opening a competition with Charles Cross for the starting left tackle position? Um, no. In fact, I, I, as great as Faltano is and, and was at the University of Washington, I'd be pretty peeved if they just booted Cross out from the starting job because he's not going to be a guard. So the idea of drafting Faltano is he's versatile enough that he could be an absolutely dominant left guard and he would be the Damian Lewis replacement. So if Seattle does go local, they pick Faltano. You have Cross at left tackle, Faltano at left guard. I guess Ola with Timmy at center. I mean, it's kind of his job to lose when, when Nick Harris is his immediate competition. Right guard, Anthony Bradford for now. We'll, we'll see if Seattle wants to add anybody there. And then Abe Lucas at right tackle. And Abe Lucas is kind of the wild card here. Uh, given his health, the expectation is, according to John Schneider back from the, um, the, the league meeting, that he should be ready for the start of the season. So if we take Schneider at his word, then we should have the same two tackles as last season. And ideally they don't both get hurt in week one. And then Falutanu can be that, uh, that left guard stability that we've been looking for basically since Steve Hutchinson left. It's been a curse at that position that Damian Lewis is basically the best left guard the Seahawks have had ever since Hutchinson left. And we're going on, uh, what, 18 years now since uh, he departed with that cursed poison pill contract. So yeah, I, I don't see any reason for Seattle to create a, a left tackle competition with Cross. And I don't even think Cross has been anything outstanding at left tackle, but he also hasn't been um, concerning enough to the point where I think eh, maybe it's, there, there, there should be some competition for him as far as a starting job. So um, let's move on to the next question here, also from Lou City Hawk. Given the norm, enormous depth and talent at wide receiver, it almost seems certain that a wide receiver will fall into the Hawks' laps at some point. Do you see then the Hawks pulling the trigger on a best player available wide receiver? And how would that affect the wide receiver room? So personally, I think that the Seahawks should draft a receiver. Uh, but I'm of the opinion that you can never have enough wide receivers. It, it is a plentiful position based on these last several draft classes. And the more depth there, the better. I'd certainly have a, a more of an affinity for wide receiver depth than say running back depth. And we know where Seattle has put in a lot of their draft capital over the years. But at wide receiver, I don't think that they will nor should they draft early, like take a wide receiver in the first round again, like they did with Smith and Jigba. But this comes with the reality that based on the way that Tyler Lockett's contract is restructured, it's very possible. In fact, I'd say more likely than not that this year is gonna be his, his last hurrah in Seattle and that they will look to move on from him in his contract here, or he'll retire, or he'll get released, what, whatever the case. They're going to have to plan for life after Lockett. I'm working on the assumption that the Seahawks are not going to be foolish enough to trade DK Metcalf. Now, that could be a conversation we can have a few years down the road. For example, I think that there's a chance that Seattle will just extend Metcalf now, uh, create a little bit more cap relief for this year, and then after Metcalf's extension is, is close to the end, a few years down the road, then perhaps – we'll see Metcalf dealt in the same that same way we've seen other top-level wide receivers dealt over the years. And nothing to do with his attitude or anything. It's just that the way that the market is, um, has played out over the last few years. Now, getting to your question about um, best player available wide receiver, day one, I don't anticipate them going receiver first round. Day two, if they do it, um, maybe Malachi Corley from Western Kentucky. I just love his ability to break tackles, and it's just been a major gripe for me that Seattle – doesn't have a lot of receivers who are capable of breaking tackles or making people miss in the open field. I think that Corley can be that sort of Debo Samuel type who, who he just makes plays uh, after the catch and he just bounces, he gets guys to bounce off of him. Now, 
it does come with the caveat that it's Western Kentucky. It's, it's he's not going up against elite competition. But when he did play Ohio State, I think he had eight catches for eighty-one yards and a touchdown. And and that's certainly not a, a scrub school that he's facing. Um, one guy I have my my eye on is Luke McCaffrey. Just just off the name alone, of course, it's the McCaffrey family dynasty. But McCaffrey went from quarterback to wide receiver. He was a quarterback at the University of Nebraska. He transitioned to wide receiver, and he's now entering the NFL draft from Rice University. Uh, six foot two, about two hundred pounds. Uh, I, I would imagine that he would be playing in the slot, which would create a little interesting dynamic there with how the Seahawks would use Smith and Jigba down the line. But I think they could be a bit interchangeable. Maybe McCaffrey could work out in the in the in the flanker role at times. But I would imagine that McCaffrey would primarily be out of the slot position. What I love about McCaffrey, um, beyond his ability to to win in zone coverage, he's got great hands. His drop rate is very low. And he is really, really impressive with his ability to make contested catches. I believe his contested catch rate, according to Pro Football Focus and maybe some other uh, sites, their advanced stats sites, his, his contested catch rate is above 60%. And that's really impressive. And for all of my praise of DK Metcalf over the years, the one thing I don't think he's really gotten better at is contested catches. It, it's just not an area where when it comes to 50-50 balls, a jump ball where he's just got to you just strong arm the ball away from a defensive back. That's not been one of his, his strong suits. And then the rest of the receiver group, I think Smith and Jake is going to be good with contested catches. Perhaps Jake Bobo could be a, a, as a fourth wide receiver option, but then everybody else, um, Lockett's 50, 50 balls, probably not going to be something that he's going to be doing too much of for the rest of his career. And even at the height of his career, that's not his style. And then you get to, you know, the bottom of the depth chart with Chanel and Derek Young and D Eskridge. All three of them are basically going to be fighting for a roster spot. So McCaffrey, I believe, is going to be a day three target um, that Seattle should absolutely consider. And he would probably be considered a BPA that deep into the draft. And I would love to have him on board. And we would get a little bit of sibling rivalry, too. You get Christian on on, on the 49ers. You get Luke McCaffrey in Seattle. But, yes, I, I think that the Seahawks could stand to um, improve the receiving group a little bit more and think a little bit more long term. So it's like in 2024 – but the 2024 season, they don't absolutely need another wide receiver. They can be fine just rolling out Metcalf, Lockett, Smith and Jigba, and um, and Jake Bobo, and then to be determined for wide receiver five. But you got to think a little bit further beyond that and come to grips with the reality that Lockett doesn't have too many more years left with the Seahawks. So this would be a uh, situation where McCaffrey could help Seattle's offense right away. But more likely, he would be one for like 2025 and 2026. And if Seattle does draft a receiver, um, the earlier they draft the receivers, to me, it's going to impact how the wide receiver room shapes up. But as long as it's not like a seventh round pick or something like that, um, it's going to impact more the bottom end of the depth chart. So what I'm thinking is Eskridge is playing for a roster spot. So is LaVisca Chanel. Although they did guarantee Chenault's um, salary. So maybe there's a little bit more to that there because he's on the vet veterans minimum, but they have guaranteed a salary. And then you've got Derek Young. And Derek Young is still pretty valuable as a special teams gunner. But in terms of his actual wide receiver ability, I mean, he wasn't particularly impressive in last year's preseason. And then he got hurt. And he's basically had a hard time even getting on the field on offense. He's been used as a blocking fullback at that time. So maybe we could get some sort of positional switch for, for Derek, make use of his, his versatility. But Young has two catches to his name. He's hardly even run routes. He Most of his snaps have been to be at, there as a blocker. So uh, I believe that we're looking at Young, Eskridge, and Chanel battling out, battling it out for, for just to getting, getting on the roster. McCaffrey would just be added to the mix uh, at that end of the table. All right, I've talked about this position enough. Let's move on to Kona Hawk. Aloha. So after his pro day performance, do you believe Michael Penix makes it past Vegas? Yeah, you know what? One of the things we have to do in life, I think that's an important thing for, for all of us, is admit we were wrong. And I will admit, I didn't think that Michael Penix had much of a shot of being a first-round pick. Not that I didn't believe in his abilities, but I was – I'm still am concerned about his his health and the fact that he has a deep injury history dating back to the University of of Indiana. So there's that's one bit. And then his combine and pro day statistics, 
it were obviously super impressive near near or at the top for, for all the measurements relative to the other quarterbacks in this class. So I believe that Penix will go based on all the chatter. Him and JJ McCarthy had their stock clearly rise, whereas Bo Nix hasn't made much of a dent. So with, with Penix, where he goes, he's not going to the top five. So we're looking at the 10 to 15 range. So New York Jets probably not taking Penix. And if they do, Aaron Rodgers is going to have steam coming out of his ears. And then you get number 11, the Minnesota Vikings. That'd be pretty fun if, if Penix in a dome environment got to throw to Justin Jefferson. Uh, it would be fun, of course, uh, as long as they're not playing the Seahawks. But I think that the Vikings would be in on J.J. McCarthy more so than Penix. The Denver Broncos, oh, boy. Wouldn't, wouldn't that be something after all of these years, well, the last two years of us just relentlessly shit-talking Broncos fans over the Russell Wilson trade? that they might get their quarterback of the future, and it's UW's Michael Penix Jr., that, that that would be some Curb Your Enthusiasm theme music playing there at the end if, if Penix falls out in Denver. But um, we'll see what happens with the Broncos. I think that Denver's going to be in on a quarterback. And then the Raiders, yeah, th that's kind of the cutoff. I don't totally rule out the Saints looking at drafting a quarterback, but it, it, they haven't drafted one in, in forever. I believe they're the only team in the NFL that has not drafted – a, um, a first round quarterback over the last 40 years or something like that. But, you know, let, let me not go on a tangent there. The Raiders, they could be a logical fit for Penix. My um, thing with Penix is on field play doesn't seem to challenge the middle of the field a whole lot. And we've had that discourse plenty in, in Seahawks among, among Seahawks fans over the last decade. So decade or so. Uh, but I also wonder about Penix in bad weather games. Because I couldn't help but think about that game against Oregon State last year where his accuracy was noticeably off. And to be fair, it was a pretty hefty downpour. And he adjusted a bit um, to the weather, especially that big fourth down play to Odunze with the game on the line. But with that said, when Penix misses, I feel like he tends to miss with overthrows. And I wonder if slippery, slippery football, rainy conditions, if that's going to be an, an issue for him, especially when he's not – playing behind an elite offensive line is his, is his accuracy going to take a hit and then will he will his arm kind of be a liability in that way until he controls a better professional level but he could fit at the Raiders absolutely they've basically taken various forms of Derek Carr over the last three years they've had actual Derek Carr they've had Jimmy Garoppolo they drafted Aiden O'Connell who's basically almost another Derek Carr type maybe poor man's Derek Carr and then you have Gardner Minshew, Mustachio Jer Derek Carr, who just doesn't turn the ball over like Jimmy Garoppolo does. So they've they've had the same sort of guy for years. Penix in that offense, he he could be electrifying, especially with Devontae Adams and, and Jacoby Myers in there. So I, I think that Penix is going to be out of reach for Seattle unless they trade up. And just to make note of that, if Seattle by any chance trades up in the first round of the draft, it has to be for a quarterback. Anything else to me is not acceptable, especially when you're picking at 16. So, yeah, I, I believe that Penix will go in the first half of the first round. And then um, after that, I would assume that Bo Nix would be the next quarterback taken, but probably not in the first round. So let's move on to Kona Hawk's other question. With so little top talent at safety and linebacker in this draft class, do you think Schneider will draft one earlier than expected? Um, so how are we defining earlier than expected? Because this question was asked a couple of weeks ago when I put up the, the mailbags uh, post on, on, on dot com. But Seattle only has one pick in the top 100 and or sorry, two picks in the top 100. They've got their other sec, their other third round pick and they have their their first round pick. So it, are, are we thinking they take a safety in the first round or they trade down and still take a safety in the first round or they take a linebacker in the early second round? They take Junior Colson or somebody like that at, at linebacker with one of their day one or, or, or early day two picks. Uh, so th that's a bit of a, a murky area to me. But safety and linebacker are absolutely positions where Seattle has very little long-term certainty. You look at the safety position, all right, they've cut Adams, they've cut Diggs, they've signed Rayshon Jenkins, but Rayshon's on a two-year contract and they could absolutely move on from him in his second year. And then unless Seattle extends Julian Love from the time I say these words till the time that this video goes up, um, he's going to be a free agent in 2025. And then below those two, you've got Kobe Bryant, who's just transitioned to safety. He's kind of a cornerback safety hybrid at this point. And then Jarek Reed and Jonathan Sutherland, you know, fringe players who haven't 
gotten on the field with regular snaps at their natural positions um, beyond preseason. So that doesn't give me any warm, fuzzy feeling about the safety position for the Seahawks. Um, that doesn't mean I want to go back to spending an exorbitant amount of money at that position, but I can see them looking heavily at the um, early rounds to, to, to get a safety, get a versatile safety, and um, add him to Mike McDonald's defense. And then linebacker, they're, they're probably compelled to draft a linebacker because they have even less steps there. Dotson, one-year contract. Baker, one-year contract. And then after those two, who, who are you looking at? John Radigan and... Patrick O'Connell, an inside linebacker. I can't remember if he's an inside or outside linebacker, but they, they've just got nothing there after the end of the season. So I, I believe that they're going to go for a linebacker earlier in the draft. And Colson, I think, would be at the top of my list. Um, he, he, he's the type that, and of course, he's got the ties from um, Mike McDonald and certainly Jay Harbaugh and other people who've been on Michigan's coaching staff and are now on the Seahawks coaching staff. But I, I believe that he is one of the top linebackers in this class. And Seattle just needs it badly. They haven't had the best time finding depth at this position. So, yeah, I can see them looking at addressing at least one of those two positions within the first three rounds. And I feel like they're compelled to. Do they want to, should they reach and take a projected fourth round linebacker in the second round? Absolutely not. But um, we'll see how it goes on that front because with the way that this roster is set up, there, there are three positions, I think, where Seattle's got long-term uncertainty cornerback safety and inside linebacker and i mentioned cornerback the other day in my article because only um woolen and witherspoon are under contract in 2025 everybody else is a impending free agent so um that that's also another position i could see seattle attacking but they're more likely to attack that on day three i would assume all right let's get to uh lofa tatupu or Lofa Tatupu. I see what you did there. Will Harbaugh, Jay Harbaugh, that is, be innovative on our approach to kickoffs? Was he hired knowing this might be happening? Um, that's a very good question. And it's okay to say, I don't know. I'm hopeful he can be innovative. In fact, this is going to be a bit of a, um, a great unknown for all of these NFL teams adjusting to the new kickoff format, of which I am a fan of, having watched the XFL um, and covering the, the Sea Dragons, I think that at an NFL level, it can be executed better than XFL uh, athletes could could perform. So when, when we're talking about innovative, um, we're thinking maybe trick plays, fake handoffs, or maybe having star players as returners, because that's the thing that we generally have, have seen teams stop doing. Like you, you don't normally have your best receiver, your best running back, uh, as your primary kick returner or punt returner these days. But with these new rules, if in theory it's supposed to make everybody safer, we're just going to reduce the number of injuries, then maybe some teams could take some chances and have some of their better players um, be in these kickoff situations where it's almost like an, a long running play at times. So I think that Kenneth Walker actually had some experience as a kick returner at Michigan State. Well, actually at Wake Forest, maybe, maybe at Wake Forest before he transferred to Michigan State. So that could be really fun if Walker is interested and they end up making him a kick returner. He gets the ball. The blocking is set up perfectly. And you can see him work in the open field because I think that Walker in space is just a hard dude to deal with when he when he gets into his, his running. Um, we had something in the comment section where DK Metcalf possibly could be a kick returner. Um, I guess it could happen. I'm not banging on it. He's done no kick. He's got no return experience. And then the other bit is the way that his speed works. If it's kind of like in a sprinter stance, he, he's somebody who can really get to his, his running kind of in that 40 to 60 meter range. But the steps he does to get there is, is his drive phase or leading up to the drive phase. Um, not somebody who's going to be like winning a 60 yard or 60 meter dash compared to Tyree Kill, who in his first three, four steps is just going to be gone out the gate. And we shouldn't expect that because DK Metcalf, for somebody of size, is an absolute athletic freak. But if it's not going to be in a straight line and Metcalf's got to turn corners or something like that or, or, or try and make people miss in the open field, be stop-start, um, that's where I think that there could be a drawback with having Metcalf as a kick returner. So I don't envision that. But Chanel could be an option because of his ability to break tackles, even though he's not much of a, a speedster. And then you've got um, Trey Brown, perhaps, because Trey Brown did return kicks in preseason last year and return kicks plenty 
um, at, at the University of Oklahoma. But I think this is going to be fun. Make the kickoff exciting again. And um, I, I think we're done with the onside kick. That's there's that's a lost cause. But the kickoff return, I still believe field position matters. And I still think that we should value the field position game. And there's going to be a lot of different strategies we're going to see um, developed through this offseason uh, to, to adjust to this revamped kickoff, this reimagined kickoff. When I say reimagined, I mean ripped off from the XFL, just like the, uh, the Skycam 20 some odd years ago. But yes, it's a very good question. And I'm eager to, to know the answer just as much as you are. Um, and by the way, as far as Harbaugh being hired, knowing this might be happening, I don't think that has anything to do with anything. It's just replace pretty much all of Carol's guys and get in our guys. And McDonald has experience with Jay Harbaugh, um, both on the Ravens and then at the University of Michigan. And Harbaugh, his track record with special teams at Michigan seems to be pretty impressive. And keep in mind that in the college game, you have the fair catch and the kickoff, and most kicks are not returned anyway these days. So that's to, to, I don't think that the, the new kickoff rules was, was some sort of inkling to move on from Larry Izzo and go to Jay Harbaugh. It's more about connections and the fact that he has a good track record dating back to college. All right, let's go on to uh, Sideshow Bob. I believe this is the last question, by the way. So uh, the strength in this draft seems to be offensive line, which is also a Seahawks need. Which do you think is more likely, sticking at 16 and taking a really top shelf alignment or trading down to add a pick or two on day two and then hoping that a good alignment is available if slash when they pick on day two? Uh, yeah, offensive line is a need for the Seahawks, and that is something that you could copy and paste as a direct quote over the last 15 years minimum. Um, so I think it's going to be e extremely likely that Seattle trades down because if they don't, then their only way to get into day two is to use some of their use their third round pick and day three draft capital, maybe dip into next year's draft capital to move up into round two. So I think they're going to trade down. They're going to be some suitors. Like I don't think the Buffalo Bills should trade up, for example, after they've dealt Stephon Diggs to go draft a wide receiver at 16. But they could do that. I mean, this is a deep wide receiver class. They could just stay at 28 or wherever they're picking and not have to give up draft capital. Well, that's beside the point. Um, certainly, Fao uh, Tanu is, is the headlining name because of his Washington connection and the fact that he is such a damn good player. But then you also have um, Graham Barton from Duke. And he could play basically every position. I mean, he could be a center, he could be a guard, he could be a tackle. It seems like his best position is going to be guard. And I don't know. I thought he would be somebody who could that, that see the Seahawks could target in the second round. But now I'm I'm fearing that he could actually go in the first round. So he, he is somebody that I'm very keen on Seattle looking at, even more so than than Fal Tanu. Uh, I believe that he is a, a, a really talented player and he's strong. He he's super athletic, just like Fal Tanu. But um, as far as what they do for for day two, yeah, if, if they trade down, um, they're, they're going to add a, a pick or two, maybe an additional third to to offset the one that they gave up, or just get into the second round. And yeah, there'll probably be some offensive linemen available there. I don't think that Seattle is going to neglect the offensive line just in a, in a brutal way and like, you know, wait until day three. That would be really stupid. And especially since we're two years removed from Schneider picking Charles Cross with the ninth overall pick and then Abe Lucas in the third round. They have made draft capital investments on the offensive line plenty over the years, whether that's Jermaine Effetti or Justin Britt or Ethan Posick, I, I could go on and on with, and Russell Okung was their very first draft pick. I'm talking, you know, those are players that they have drafted in the first or second round just over the last, for, for the entirety of, of, of their tenure. Well, I guess the entirety of John's tenure because they're gonna leave Pete Carroll out of this. Um, but they've just not been ones to break the bank in terms of giving them a second contract or sign any of the top names in free agency or, or trade for a high level offensive lineman um, either in the offseason or in the middle of the season. Dwayne Brown is basically as bold as they got, and they had to because Fan tore his ACL in that preseason, and then the replacements, Odie Ambo and whoever else was starting, abject disaster. They were kind of forced into that. So I think that Seattle is going to look at the offensive line. Even if they if they stay at 16, then all options are on the table. But I, I believe that um, day two is, is where they're going to look towards getting a guard and I know I think they'll stick with guard. I think that Olawatimi will win the job, but they're going to focus more on getting a guard 
John Schneider says that guards are overpaid and overdrafted. Well, you could draft a guard in the second round and be fine with that, but that they're not just going to sit on the asses and, and, and sit this one out because if they do, then um, yeah, I'm just going to hope for the best as far as the state of this offensive line, because it could be really bad. Um, so I was wrong. We actually have one more question here. Arctic Fox winter. Who is the one player the Seahawks can't miss out on? Hmm. I really don't know. I really don't know. Maybe this is something that I'll look at, you know, studying more draft prospects over the next couple of weeks. On the defensive side of the ball, if Johnny Newton is there at 16, or if he's still there after the Seahawks trade down from 16 to wherever within the first round, I think they should take him. I really believe they are compelled to, to draft a defensive tackle who can be a truly elite player. Um, that's pretty much it. On the offensive side of the ball, I imagine that if Faltano is there, sure, take him. If Faltano or Barton is there, take him. But I, I don't think there's any one player I'm going. Seattle absolutely needs to draft that person. Uh, all the options are open. You got a new coaching staff. Supposedly that the the whole um, supposedly the whole draft strategy is not going to change much under John Schneider. So perhaps they'll still look at lanky corners. Perhaps they'll still look at certain wide receivers, or they're going to draft a running back again because they only got three on the roster right now. It, it's a true unknown. And I'm fascinated to see how this is all going to go down. Notice I didn't mention quarterback at all. I don't think the Seahawks are going to draft a quarterback in the first round. Um, and if they do, they're probably trading up for one. Um, would they go after Penix? Sure. They absolutely could draft Michael Penix Jr., but I think he'll be off the board by then. Um, but the Sam Howell trade, I believe, was kind of the hint that they know they're not going to be getting any of the top quarterbacks, Daniels, Williams, May, et cetera. And that's after the major set of quarterbacks, if they don't take Bo Nix, for example, I, I, I would imagine that they're just going to go without drafting a quarterback again or pick one in the sixth or seventh round to serve as a third string emergency option. So, yeah, I, I will definitely get back to you on that one as far as the one player where I'm going, yes, Seattle absolutely needs to draft that person. If they don't, then John Schneider should basically be unemployed tomorrow. Um, so on that note, again, thank you very much for all of these mailbag questions. And um, just a special announcement, April 23rd, so two Tuesdays from now, we're going to do a live Q&A, which is something we did last year, a live Q&A in the field goals comment section. It'll be me for now. We'll see if John Gilbert is available that day. I haven't figured out a time yet, but it's kind of an ask me anything about the NFL draft. So two days out from draft day, we'll uh, answer all of your questions live from XPM to whenever. And uh, hopefully it's a fun, interactive thing. We did it last year. It was really entertaining. We're going to do it again this year and give you plenty of other draft coverage uh, pieces and scouting reports to come over the next few weeks. Um, you see the scroll down there, YouTube, Twitter, Facebook, where you can find me or where you can find field goals and follow and subscribe and do all that stuff. So until next time, thank you very much for all the questions. Hope you enjoyed this video and go Hawks.